And it is so good to be in God's house today with you, his people. Well, I've discovered something in my lifetime. That in the midst of some of the greatest scriptural, the, the greatest passages of scripture, I'm often drawn to the more obscure parts of them. Just those little things that, uh, that maybe we glide over all the time. Now, John chapter 11 is a great passage of scripture. It deals with uh, uh, the, the, the sickness and the death and the raising of Lazarus, Jesus' friend, from the dead. I mean, you don't get much bigger than that. I mean, it contains an absolutely wonderful, miraculous experience. It, has a, it, it is the sign of, of the power of Jesus over death. It also, uh, in that chapter, though, we also uh, uh, maybe wonder sometimes, why did Jesus stay where he was two days when he heard that Lazarus was sick? And it says it right there in John chapter 11. But someone, the, the message came to Jesus that, John, that Lazarus was sick, and he stayed there two more days. I, I don't fully did. Maybe another the one, one thing that crossed my mind is that maybe, per, that perhaps when, when Christ delays doing something that we have asked him to, perhaps it's because he wants to do something even greater than what we know already. But we also hear the accusations against Jesus. They said, some of the folks said, you know, he had the ability to heal the blind man. Why couldn't he keep Lazarus from dying? And you, you have those, those little voices around the edge of everything that God does. Well, just why couldn't he have done it better? As if we could have done it better, okay? In this passage, we also see Jesus branded as a fugitive. And, and, and they are seeking to bring him to, to justice, to their, their form of justice. In fact, maybe perhaps there was even a reward on his head. Who knows? But in this passage of Scripture, there is life, there is death, there is resurrection, all in this scene as Jesus makes his way to Calvary, as Jesus makes his way to the cross. Now, this is the last time that Jesus will appear uh, in, in public with a miraculous sign, and you got to admit, that was a pretty miraculous thing to raise a guy from the dead after he'd been dead for four years, but that was the last miraculous sign that Jesus was going to show the people that he might, that, that he was who he said he was. And once more, he appeared publicly with an impassioned plea for people to believe in him and to trust him and to, and, and to, to walk with him um, before his crucifixion. Well, the verse that caught my attention in all of this is found in John chapter 11, verse 55. And I told you, it's just kind of an obscure part of the narrative. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Many went up for the country, from the country to Jerusalem for their, ceremonial, for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. So let's take a look and see what these country folks can teach us. Perhaps not only about Passover, but about our relationship with Jesus Christ. A Passover goes all the way back, you know, uh, if you know your Bible at all, goes all the way back to the Israelites' deliverance from Egyptian slavery under Moses' leadership. Uh, Exodus chapters 11 and 12 talks about it. It comes as the culmination of, of, uh, of, of 10 plagues that, that were visited upon, uh, upon the Egyptian people uh, as God was trying to convince them to let these slaves go and to follow him where he was going to lead them. And uh, you know many of the, the different, different details, perhaps, I'm sure of it. Now, the word Passover itself refers to uh, the death angels passing over of the Israelites' dwellings the night when all the Egyptian firstborn were killed. And if you remember the, the, the Mo, that God spoke to Moses and Moses told the people, he said, I want you to, uh, I want you to go and I want you to... Uh, I want you to, to, to separate a, a lamb out for me for, for a few days, and then I want you to slaughter that lamb, and then I want you to roast that lamb, and then I want you to take some of that lamb's blood and put it on the doorpost of your house. And so, so that when the death angel comes, he will pass over those houses that are sprinkled with that blood. And so hence the word Passover came into place. Now, Passover contained certain restrictions and, and preparations and different activities that had to be, they were all a part of it. 
all of the yeast, one of the, one of the restrictions or one of the commandments of the Passover was that all the yeast was to be removed from the house, from everyone's house, because yeast is symbolic of their former life. Yeast is symbolic of, the, of, of corruption and, and, and uncleanness, and it was to be taken care of. So, so before, before the Passover, as it was approaching, they went into their houses and, and they, they searched all over the place. And, and sometimes it's a very elaborate thing that they would take a light, a candle, and search to make sure there was no yeast hiding anywhere in the house. So they were, that, and so there were uh, people that they were they were to stay away from certain things that might pre might prevent their participation. They were they were to stay away. They were not to touch dead bodies. They were to stay away from open sores, and if they had an open sores, that disqualified them from participation. They were to uh, there were even certain places that they were to, uh, uh, to to stay away from. And now now what I find is a bit of irony is in the 18th chapter of John, verse 28 where the, the high priests and all the religious leaders, all of the, all of the people that were, that were after Jesus, and, and they had him in their hands, and they had already tried him before the, for the religious authorities. They were just, all they had to do was to go to the Roman authorities to get permission to put him to death. And so it was on the early hours of that Friday morning when ultimately he was crucified. But in John 18, 28, it says they, they went out and they stood outside of, the, uh, of, 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 Pilate's, of the, the of Pilate's residence of his office building because to go inside would have made them unclean and they would have been disqualified from celebrating the Passover. Now that's an interesting bit of irony as far as I'm concerned because, I mean, here they were doing everything they could by whatever means they could to put this man to death. But they want to do something that's unclean. Got to back away from that. And there are all kinds of other restrictions. They were, they were to offer certain activities and participate in certain activities. They were to kill. As I mentioned, they were to bring a lamb into... Uh, um, kind of separate it out from the rest of their flocks and they were to bring it in and almost basically kind of I won't say fatten it up but they were they were to take special care of it because when the Passover came they were to sacrifice it and they were to eat it quickly because they were going to be uh, because they were going to be uh, leaping that very night and so every year the Israelites were to remember their deliverance through the Passover feast they were to remember that every year. In fact, when you look at uh, Exodus chapter 12, verses 24 through 28, listen to what, what it says. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded, Moses and Aaron. And so there were preparations, there were activities, there were stories that were to be told year after year after year after year. And you got to know that there was a risk that somewhere along the line, um, of this becoming commonplace and taken for granted. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, it's just Passover. What's, you know, what's the big deal? Okay, well, you know, separate the lamb out. Uh, Mama, you go get the yeast and get it out of the house. And da -da 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 oh, yeah, kids, by the way, um, this means that, uh, uh, that our forefathers were set free from Egypt and God delivered them. And, okay, let's eat. It very well could have happened that way. But nevertheless, it was a vital part of their story. Is a vital part of their faith and their relationship with God. And it's not a coincidence that Jesus' crucifixion took place during the Passover. It's not a coincidence. It was ordained that way. Well, as we launch ahead here about two or 3,000 years to where you and I are today, we're looking at and thinking about the preparation for the cross. Now, each year about this time, we begin to focus a little bit more upon the cross. We begin to think about the cross of Christ and the resurrection, which, by the way, this year, Good Friday is on April 6th, and Easter Sunday is April the 8th. And um, so just so you got it in your calendar, so you got it in your mind, that's when it is. When's Easter this year? Good Friday is April 6th, Easter is April 8th, 
And wouldn't it be great if we could have 400 people here on Easter Sunday? Well, that'd, be, that'd be wonderful. It would just be a, it'd be a shot in the arm, wouldn't it? It'd be great. So begin now, begin now even to think about and to pray about and say, okay, who, who can I encourage to come and be a part of uh, Easter Sunday, that wonderful celebration? Well, during this time, in preparation for the cross, we call it, it's called Lent. Uh, during this time, churches often offer special activities. When I was a kid growing up, there were about six churches that got together during Holy Week between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, and every night they would have a service, and on Friday afternoon they would have a Good Friday service. There, was, uh, there were two Methodist churches, two Nazarene churches, United Brethren Church, and a free Methodist church, if I'm not mistaken. I think those were, the, those were the six that were involved. And the pastors would take turns, and we would all go to those services, and they really became a highlight. They really became a blessing. And, uh, and sometimes, uh, I remember as, as a teenager, uh, they would form a, a, a community choir. And on Easter Sunday night, we would, we would present a cantata. And uh, uh, the first one we did was called No Greater Love, written by John Peters. And every now and then, when I'm reading a scripture that, had, that, that was part of that cantata, all of a sudden the, the, the tune and the song just kind of becomes, you know, No Greater Love. Well, anyway, you're not interested in that. But... Um, it's, it's, it's all part of it. Churches do that kind of thing. This year, this past Wednesday, for the first time in my lifetime, 61 years, we had a special Ash Wednesday service. Um, I've never done that before. There have been times when, you know, Bible studies and prayer meetings would say, hey, today is Ash Wednesday. This is kind of what it means. But this last, this last Wednesday, we, we, we did more than that. We opened up the sanctuary early in the morning for anybody that wanted to come and receive the sign of the cross on their forehead in ashes. And uh, about 13 people to, uh, participated in that. And uh, it, was, uh, it, was a, it was a moment of, of blessing and, and a moment of, of, of encouragement. That evening, we came back together uh, in a worship service where about 80 of us received communion Wednesday night. And a very, you know, I mean, man, it touched my heart. I don't know if it did anybody else or not, but it touched my heart. We had a great time of just thinking about it. And the emphasis was, was humiliation and how, you know, humiliation goes along with this thing of following Jesus. We talked about Christ's humiliation. We talked about, about uh, identification. You know, we, we, when you think about um, Christ becoming a, a man, he identified himself with us. That was all part of his baptism. But, uh, but we also identify with him. You know, not, only, not only do we hope that our life testifies to the goodness of Jesus and to the grace of God in our lives, but we wanted to make it visible and say, hey, I follow Jesus. And then we talked uh, Sunday night, or Wednesday night rather, about, about sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus, the sacrifice perhaps of, of service, of, of doing something for others during these, uh, during these 40 days. And, and then uh, we talked about sin and repentance. And we're not talking about necessarily a kind of a roller coaster to say, well, I'm going to go do something bad, then I'm going to repent, then I'm going to do something bad, we just kind of go, no, because no, Jesus died to give us victory over sin. But there are those times when we just need to say, Lord Jesus, there's stuff in my life that's not right, and I need you to take it out. And I, I repent of it, I, I turn away from it, and, and so on. Well, that was the synopsis of Wednesday night's message. This year, we are offering the, 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 the journey to the cross, the material for... Uh, adults and youth and children. I just referenced it uh, a little bit. Uh, and there is uh, a short scripture reading and places for reflection for each day and, and through the days of Lent all the way actually up until, uh, up until the Thursday after Easter. And again, those will be available if you want them. Churches offer, offer things. This, sun, this, uh, this year on Palm Sunday, April 1st, we're going to have a combined Nazarene service out of the Kelowna Church uh, in Grace, at Grace Community Church of the Nazarene where we're on, on uh, Palm Sunday night and all that kind of stuff. So churches offer special things. This time of year we focus on the cross, the message of the cross, what Jesus has done for us and in us and, and what he wants to do through us. And also sometimes, uh, quite often, people will focus uh, and, and, and reflect on the last portion of the Gospels, Matthew 21, uh, Jesus coming into Jerusalem, and Mark 11, and 9, Luke 19, and John 12, where those, where the, those begin the, 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 what were called the passion event of Jesus' life. 
where they uh, uh, thing and I remember one time I was going to look for it this morning but I forgot but a long time ago when I was first starting out in the ministry I found what was called the harmony of the gospels and I was here at Rock Island and uh, and and I said oh man this would be a great thing to give to the people to read so I took I took and it was like four pages long that had scriptures reading out of each out of each gospel and, and bless her heart Donna Moore was the church secretary at that time and she typed all those things out on a mimeograph you know what a mimeograph was that that blue paper with ink and all that junk man well, you know and here's this 22 year old you know sister pastor say oh by the way Donna can you do this sure and it, bless her heart she did it you know I don't know how many pages it was but it was long but we try to do those things to help us to think about what Jesus is doing and has done and wants to do Tele the television and movie industry even gets in on the act sometimes they present either new shows or old TV films. I remember it was in the spring of 1968 when I was 17. I watched on television uh, uh, The King of Kings. Now, I was a little disappointed when I was looking this week at, you know, people in those days didn't really think The King of Kings was that great of a movie uh, for a variety of reasons. But it was the first time I was able to grasp and understand that Jesus died for me. And I mean, you know, I mean, they, you know, they talk about how, how everything had to be just so sterilized and so, you know, I mean, it couldn't be, I mean, you know, they, they even said Jer Jeffrey Hunter had to shave his armpits when he was on the cross because they didn't want to offend people. It's a long way from the passion of the Christ, let me tell you. <laughs> so, you know, through the, and, and think, I was thinking about it in, a, in, in uh, we're talking about the Jesus film. You know, how people seeing these things make a connection with what Christ has done. And then, of course, later on, there was, uh, there was Jesus of Nazareth in the, in the days of TV miniseries. And, of course, uh, Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ in 2004 opened on Ash Wednesday. And, and uh, man, what an impact that has had. And, of course, some, some, uh, <clears throat> some aspiring network or, or local TV station will you know, surely drag out the Ten Commandments uh, you know, for the 50th time or the 70th time. You know, just, you know, watch um, Charlton Heston stand there and shake his hand. Now, Lent and the cross do not necessarily have the same appeal to the world as Christmas does. For some reason, it's easier to think of a baby being born than a man being, die being crucified, nailed to a cross. But nevertheless, it's there. Culture, our, our culture kind of passes right to Easter, you know. Go right to Easter, do not pass the cross. Go right to Easter with, you know, peeps and and chocolate and bunny flowers and good stuff. Um, but you know, there are some things that, that, that cause us for reflection. I was talking to, to Dave Freeland a few weeks ago, and he said that, that while he was in Germany uh, over the last couple of years, he, uh, at least on one occasion, he visited uh, one, of the, one of the World War II prison camps. He said that is an awful experience. He said that the heaviness and almost the sense of evil is all over that place. And the same is true when you go to, uh, if you go to Gettysburg. Now, I don't know if it's because we all have heard the Gettysburg address so many times that, that you know, but a few years ago, my wife and I stopped just briefly for about an hour and a half at, at Gettysburg. And how quiet it is. And almost how, how hallowed it is. And, you know, places like um, my, my sister-in-law took her youth group to the Holocaust Museum in Detroit. It's, it has the same effect. And so when you think about the cross of Jesus Christ, there is a sobering effect on it. And when you think about the death of Jesus, you know, and, you know, you understand that the world just doesn't really want to mess with that. But we likewise face the risks of familiarity you know, it's just another series of activities, another series of things got to be done. We can almost become callous to a cross. I, I hate to admit this, but a, a few years back, I'm not sure, uh, it was several years ago, um, but I was reading, I was reading about the crucifixion in the Bible, and I fell asleep. Now, how much more callous can you get than that? And all of a sudden, I thought, man, here's the action that brought about my salvation and I fall asleep reading about it. And so we have to be careful. But I want to just 
talk about some things to consider this morning briefly. As we prepare for the cross, as we prepare for Christ, and his crucifixion, as we prepare during this season of Lent, this season of the year when, when you know, some familiar things happen, First of all, begin with Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 to try to grasp the magnitude of Christ's self-emptying grace and sacrifice. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on a cross. Think about it. What was the step that took him from there to here? And think about the magnitude also of Jesus' move from eternity to time and to space and matter and all of the things that, that he did and was going to endure as part of that helps us to realize the enormity of sin and the immensity of sin's solution. And I think that possibly a strong sense of the depth of sin generates in us an appreciation for the price of sin's solution. You know, if you realize, if you realize how, how bad something is and how dirty something is and how filthy something is, you realize what it takes to take care of that badness and that dirt and that filth. And then when we come to realize and have a strong appreciation for the price of sin's solution, it leads us to a strong love for the person who paid the price for sin's solution, and that's Jesus. And we also an understanding of, of Jesus then and his power over death enables to face it differently than if we did not have him. Jerry Burge, <clears throat> when he was a seminary student, uh, was assigned as part of his internship to a Lutheran church. And there he was to work with the youth group, the high school group. And, and in the course of, uh, of uh, that time, he got to know a a youth sponsor by the name of Barbara. And Barbara <clears throat> was every sense of the word a follower of Jesus Christ. She became sick and within a few short weeks and months terminal. And so as she was just as she was in the last days perhaps even hours of her life Gary and her had formed a bond over the few months that they'd been together. And she, she said to him, she said, Gary, he said, don't worry about me. I'm about to go on the greatest adventure of my life. And she did not say that in a death-denying or a fantastical way or a fantasy way. She just believed that she was going to be with Jesus the depths of her heart. So as we make preparations for the journey to the cross this year, let's also remember the events. Let's remember the cross. Let's remember the, the death of Jesus. Let's remember the pain and the suffering. And let's think about the sin that, that brought about that pain and suffering so that we can really understand and appreciate even more and more the love of God that is at work in Jesus Christ. Let's stand together, shall we? And have a word of prayer. Oh Lord God, we thank you today for the seasons of, of the year. And again, while we have seasons according to the calendar and seasons according to the weather and seasons according to the... We also have seasons according to Jesus. Lord, as we are entering into this season of Lent, perhaps you have called upon us to, uh, to deny ourselves, to fast something or some things 
Perhaps you have called upon us to, uh, to, to give of ourselves in a particular way um, on a daily basis that perhaps we wouldn't have thought about otherwise. But Lord, more than anything else, keep us away from callousness. Remind us of your great love. And the power of Jesus Christ that is in the world today to take away sin and to prepare us for everlasting life and to help us to live a, a way that honors and glorifies you each and every day. Lord, thank you and, and, and continue to draw near to us even now as we sing once again your praises. Amen. <laughs>